All right. So it's a medicine class, right? It's about what we do, taking care of people. Mm -hmm. So why do we care about this leaf stuff? Mm -hmm. well, you you can can do everybody loves to sue everybody. Everybody loves to sue everybody. Give which quick bind. Okay, give you a bind. <laughs> Depending on your perspective, you might. Yeah. Yeah, right? Because not only, because basically there's kind of two issues, civil issues and criminal issues, right? And there's state and federal laws that relate to all this stuff. So yeah, so you need to have a basis of understanding. Okay? So if I come and restrain you against your will and put you in my car and drive off, what's that called? So, yeah. Kidnapping. Kidnapping, yeah, yeah. So as an EMT, how is that not kidnapping what you do? Because the person's unconscious. All right, so, but that's where you got to kind of be able to say, this will get me in trouble by doing this. This is the correct way to do it, to stay out of trouble. Right? So yeah, so that's what the legal <coughs> aspects are. Okay. okay, so things we're going to talk about. Moral ethics. Okay, it does break down. Okay, All right. So we're going to talk differentiate a little bit about moral ethics and law. So that's kind of one big group. We're going to talk about basically what you're allowed to do. That's that scope of practice stuff. And then basically you're compared to a standard, which is the standard of care. Okay. Then there's some other legal stuff that will get you in trouble. Does anybody know what negligence is? Oh, are so, you thinking me to <laughs> Sure. So, but, but basically, if you don't perform to a certain expected level, you can get sued. And basically, you get sued for negligence and stuff. Okay? Um, she just stayed Good. All right. So, morals. Anybody have an idea what morals are? So there's a big Webster, big fancy. Can anybody summarize that? What is it? What's a moral? It's the right or wrong. Terms to be right or wrong. So it's right or wrong. Okay. Yeah. So, but does so you said it's society. So is abortion moral or immoral? It depends. Okay, well, so there, I was going to say, so actually a moral is kind of a personal belief. So a moral is what you feel is right or wrong. Mm -hmm. So there are some folks in this country that feel abortion is okay. There are some folks that believe that it's horribly wrong. The moral is what you feel. So it's, a, it's an individual. So part of the thing about this country is that we all have different morals. We come from different upbringings and different backgrounds. We have different religious thoughts and different ideas about what's right or wrong. So we need to basically, as, as responders, public safety folks, we need to understand that folks may have a different opinion than what we do. So, but anyway, so a moral is basically an individual thing of right or wrong. So, what about ethics? So what's Ethics. How are morals differ than ethics? Ethics would be more of our societies. Okay. A general ethics are established by a group. Morals are individuals. Yeah. So when you go to a lawyer. Lawyers are basically, you know, you expect certain types of well, with the students because lawyers have a bad rap so much. You go to an account, okay? When you take your money there, okay, you expect him to behave in a certain fashion. And you expect him to do the thing that's right and to treat you fairly. So you have certain expectations, right? When you go see a doctor, you have the same thing, right? So you expect him to be knowledgeable, competent, understanding empathetic and, and will kind of point you in the right direction. So yeah, so ethics are rules set by a group. 
as a EMS provider, we have a set of ethics. And basically what it is that we, there's a statement that basically says, this is what you should expect of us. So what do you hope is in that ethical statement? Okay, so yeah, so we're actually going to provide, so if somebody falls down, we just don't go, hey. <laughs> right. So that actually we go take care of people. Yeah? What else? With an intent to help. Okay. What else? <coughs> With consent or implied consent. Right. So well, we'll operate within your best interest. Yeah. So we can do that. Um, so what type of care? Just middle of the road care? Uh, best we can do. Okay. So quality care. So some sort of quality standard there, right? Um, anything else? And I think I think care within the confines of what society and culture would deem appropriate. Okay. And then Thank you. So, up to date, current. Well, yeah, but also, I guess using current technology or whatnot. Okay. Also, also using, I guess, not so much. Since we're talking about ethics, not so much like what someone, someone's morals. I'd say an individual wanted wanted you to go out, and I guess just let them die or, or kill them and to the, to the sense that they would always want to be euthanized and where that wouldn't be considered or deemed appropriate by society would be a point where I think we would draw a line. Okay. So yeah, so that we operate within the law and what's best for overall society. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so there is a statement. Basically, the National Association of EMTs actually put out a position statement, and basically an ethics statement. Every major profession has it. So, you know, as, as public teachers, public school teachers, they basically say, yes, send us your kids, we're going to grow them, we're going to make them better citizens, we're going to educate them, they're going to be able to do the X, Y, Z. Right? Every profession has it. I encourage you to go read the one from the NASA Associates Community. You are representing that profession. That is what we have told the public. We've stood up and basically said, here's what we will do. Because we see folks at the worst, right? So we see folks that are in trouble and they're in the bathroom. They slipped and fell in the bathroom. It's three in the morning and they're in pain. And you, they call you and invite you into their home. That's a big responsibility. And because of that, we basically stood up and said, this is what you should expect. You should expect us to not go run back to your neighbor and go, ah, do you know what happened? <laughs> you should expect that we will be respectful of you. So that if you're in a compromising position, that we will protect you somehow. So, yeah, so you, you know, you're really truly sick in the middle of the road and we need to assess you. That sometimes means that we cut clothes. But hopefully we cover you up and we protect you. So we're having to cut your clothes off in the middle of something because we really need to find a problem and fix it, that we just don't let the TV camera. So sure, here, watch this. Right? <laughs> so then we actually kind of say, you know, hey, here, put up a sheet, put up a barrier, do something. We need to do something. Get the camera crews out of here. Back up so that we protect that right of that individual so that we operate in their best interest. Right? Um, and there's unfortunately all sorts of things about it. There's somebody posted, somebody up in New York, um, somebody died. An EMT in New York took a picture and posted it on Facebook. The family found the picture. So stuff like that, where you just kind of go, what do you think? Okay. So, but yeah, so they saw, and I'm not exactly sure, but you know, a lot of folks kind of go, oh, that looks, you know, stuff that looks kind of gross and disgusting. So, medicine folks go, wow, that looks kind of look. You can see this and that. You know, so to a point, it can be some of that stuff can be educational, but you don't put it on a public site. If it's an educational experience, then you go, Look, here's the thing, here's what happened. You see how this happened. Had we done this, this would have worked out better. 
so that it's used even though it's not a, you know, you're taking pictures of somebody that is deceased, it has benefit and value to the rest of society. It's done in a correct way. So but that ethical statement basically covers all of that. So what should they expect? How do we treat them? Um, so now, this ethical responsibility, and part of what we basically said is that, right, so we already identified that we have different morals. So some folks basically, because we have different morals, folks have a right to determine kind of what happens to themselves. Y'all heard of DNR? Do not resuscitate? Yeah. What does that mean? Do not resuscitate. Right. So basically it says, I as an individual made a decision that if certain things happen, do not do do not give me treatment. You get cancer. You have a right to refuse treatment. The doctor can stand up all day long and say, we need to operate, we need to do this, we need to provide all this stuff. The individual has the right to go, no, I don't think that's in my best interest. Yes, I understand that I'm going to die, but even with the treatment, my life's going to be such a, a poor existence that I don't feel that that has value. I would rather gracefully go <coughs> So, but somebody else may be going, you're nuts. Why would you do it? And, you know, but we have to respect their right as an individual. So you may disagree. You may feel that we should always, always, always strive to do something. If, we, if there is a possibility of success, that we should go down this path. You've got to step back from that and kind of go, wait a minute. This isn't my decision. This is their decision. And based upon this legal framework, they have that right to do it. And it's hard sometimes because we may not always disagree. Um, because there's some stuff, because even some cultures do different treatments. So they may or may not accept treatments. So some folks believe are against immunizations. They don't believe that they should get it. but. Most of society goes, well, yeah, because if you're having this disease, I don't want to get it. So there's all sorts of stuff where people have a right to decide what they want, within reason, as long as it's not a public health issue. So, but yeah, so we have a right to, to make their needs a priority. We have to maintain our skills and knowledge. Right? So if you don't do something, like surgical airways, y'all ever seen TV shows where they cut the throat and they do that, okay? If you become a paramedic, maybe once in your career you will do that. Maybe. So that means you don't do it very often, right? But the time that you need to do it, is it a big deal? It's a huge deal. So even though you haven't done it in three years and you probably don't really expect to do it, you need to be prepared to do it. So that's where it goes to maintain skills and knowledge. Even though you haven't seen it, you need to go, you know, I haven't practiced one of those in a while. Where's the practice stuff? Let's get it out. Okay. I'm forgetting this information. Let's go back and review this information. Okay. So you've got to maintain that. Um, honestly, review how you did. Okay. Go, you know, evaluate. So how did that go? What can I do better next time? How do I get that? Okay. And I've done that lots of times where I come in and I try to do the patient. I end up pissing off the patient. All right, that didn't work. So afterwards, hopefully I go back and go, how did I cross that line? <coughs> what should I have seen to make, them, to make me back off of how I was approaching that patient? So the <coughs> All right. Um, you know, so we talked about that. It is written by Dr. Gillespie. Anyway, it's there. So if you search for EMT ethical statement, it'll pop up. So it's, in, it's on the NAEMT website. All right, so we have different types of laws. Okay. So where, let's do this. Anybody, what is it? Show off. Oh, some of y'all are on. It was on TV when we were kids. It was a little bill that we were on. Schoolhouse Rock. Schoolhouse Rock. Yeah, see, you're too young. <laughs> so anyway, from Schoolhouse Rock, for those that remember it, how does the, how does the law work? Where does the laws come from? <coughs> Bill? Oh, right, so but who makes the bill? Yep. But what branch? How does that work? Uh, Someone legislative. said a legislative branch, right? Mm -hmm. So we have the legislative branch that basically kind of generally has bills. But 
what supersedes the legislative branch, because it happens all the time. Courts go and go, this law is unconstitutional. Judicial, the judicial right. branch. So, well, but we have judicial stuff, but right. So, the foundation of all our laws is basically the U.S. Constitution, and then the states have their own right. constitution. So, we have this overall framework that says these are our beliefs. Within that framework, we have these legislation, <coughs> these, these laws. Okay. So, you have the legislative branch that does stuff. Okay. So, who's the executive branch? President, President the governor, the head of the state, the head of the of the federal government, right? Does he have the ability to make law? To, to, to a very limited point, yeah? Right, because he can basically come out and say, by executive order, we're going to do this. So within reason, you can get certain things. So the president does have very limited power, but basically if the judge doesn't like it, or if the legislature doesn't like it, then they go, so sorry, here's a law that supersedes you. Okay. So but the, the executive branch does have some power within reason. Okay. You talked about the judicial branch. So anybody heard of your your Miranda rights? What is that? Individual rights. Okay. So during what? So when do those get applied? Oh, all right, so, so you get arrested. Where did those come from? And by now? Uh, it was a court case. Yeah, it was a court case. Right? Exactly. So yeah, so it was Miranda versus somebody, right? But basically the judge says, if you're going to arrest somebody, here's what we expect. It is not a legislative law, so it's not in legislature, but basically it's a court opinion. So it has, the courts can, you know, which basically the legislature can then kind of tweak it if they don't like it, but basically judges have the ability to kind of enforce certain things. Right? So they can kind of create law. So they basically say, and the Supreme Court does it all the time. So yeah, so we agree that this is, so abortion is legal or not. That's kind of a Supreme Court decision. That wasn't a legislative decision, right? So the legislature, so the, ju did I say that right? It was a judicial decision, not a legislative decision. So the judicial branch can, within reason, do some they basically say, this is our interpretation of what this law means. So they're supposed to interpret the meaning of the law, not actually legislate from the bench, because that's where the, when you hear a Supreme Court justice, they you get into it all the time. Well, don't legislate from the bench. Your job is to interpret what the system says. So, but to do that, a lot of times they have to create rules. This is what we expect. And so generally when they, one branch of the government does it, other, or the other, well, one, when one judge does it, other courts then recognize that, and there's some linkings there. So, does that make sense, the judicial law? Now, <coughs> administrative law, anybody know what this is? Anybody heard of OSHA? EPN? Yeah. Right. You do? Right. right. So, can they make law? Can they, they tell can you what to do? Uh, they, can, they can make rules, basically, right. kind of what they're, right? So, yeah, so, and, and basically for EMS, right? We, the legislature basically says, EMS exists, EMTs exist, the Department of State Health Services should make rules that enforce certain principles. So, by legislative law, they created an administrative branch of the government and said, your job is to do this. Go make rules about this. And there's a rulemaking process. So for EMS, basically, there's some public input. And so they come and they basically, there's what's called the Governor's EMS and Trauma Advisory Council. So it's a public meeting where folks come and discuss and say, they want to do this. And we they debate back and forth and say, this is what we want to do. They listen to public input, and then ultimately they decide, and they make a recommendation to the administrative branch who then makes the rule. So instead of the legislature trying to be nitpicky about every little thing, they basically say, you guys are the experts. Go deal with this. Go forth and do it. Right? So OSHA is an administrative branch of the government. EPA, Department of State Health Services, you know, there's occupation codes and stuff. Um, the Texas Medical Board. Um, all of these groups basically make administrative code. 
So it is in essence the same thing as law. You don't do what you're supposed to do, then they can, whatever, whatever their rules say, then they can turn around and fine you. They can revoke your certification. <coughs> um, they generally can't throw you in jail uh, because that becomes a criminal offense, but they can basically make your life miserable within what they're allowed to do. So does that make sense? Now, one little interesting thing. When you look at the laws, you know, morals, what we said earlier, morals and ethics, basically this is right, this is wrong. When you look at laws, it only defines what is wrong within a limited scope. It doesn't define everything that's wrong. It only says these things are wrong, and it doesn't say this is actually right. This is the best thing to do. So laws are designed by nature to define what's wrong. If you violate a law, then you break in some component, and then therefore this, these options can occur. Does that make sense? So laws are not morals in that where they, morals say this is right, this is wrong. Laws only say this is wrong. Okay. So stuff that affects us, right, the health and safety code, which is basically what defines us and EMS, how we do what we do, what are the rules about operating ambulances, the equipment, the training, um, <laughs> certification, recertification, what you're supposed to learn in this course, all that's defined by administrative code. Right. The traffic code, why do we care about that? We just either basically driving Yeah, driving Right, so driving ambulance, you are allowed to violate Certain laws. You were given an exemption to how fast you travel, the direction that you travel, where you park. Okay. There are certain things that you're given. Okay. Uh, so detention of mentally ill. Okay, so basically mental laws make a difference. Let's see. You say certification, certification, disciplinary. Yeah, so they define all that stuff, right? So what's the disciplinary stuff? So you fail to meet certain recertification requirements. Okay? You don't treat, you don't follow the orders that you're given. Um, there's certain things that basically where you can be disciplined for. Okay, so scope of practice. Okay. In general, scope of practice basically defines the boundaries of what you're allowed to do. So tell me this, so what are some things, what do you know the difference between an EMT and a paramedic? What can EM, paramedics do that EMTs can't? Right. Okay, start IVs, innovate. innovate. Everybody with that advanced life support and I'm a therapist that. Right, yeah, so what, make, what makes them advanced life support? So they can innovate, start IVs. Um, cardiac monitors. Okay, yeah. Right, they can push, they can push more meds than what the e you can do, right? So those scope of practice is defines those boundaries. Okay. Some states basically have a floor and a roof. So as an EMT, you may only do these things, nothing more. Texas has taken a little bit different approach than the rest of the country. So understand, so does that make sense? The scope of practice defines what you can do and what you can't do. Okay. Texas has taken a little bit different approach. Texas doesn't have a scope of practice per se. What they say is basically local rule presides. So they basically say, in Texas, a physician has the right to allow <coughs> EMTs, paramedics, to do whatever he says they have to do. So theoretically, a physician can say to you as an EMT, you may now remove somebody's appendix. So now, to do that though, that physician had better be able to prove that he determined that you were competent and knew what you were doing and knew how to do it and knew, were able to do it in a safe manner. Because if he can't prove that, then he will lose his license. So, but simple things. So like, some places in Texas, EMTs have been trained to start IVs. So even though they're EMTs, it's not a standard practice in, that's part of the normal education process, they can now go outside the boundaries a little bit. Okay. So in essence, there's a floor, but there's not necessarily a roof. Does that make sense? Okay. So again, nationally, there's typically a floor and a roof. Texas generally removes the roof. So 
Well, in, in which I guess I'm biased because I was born here, but looking at how some other states do it, I absolutely agree. A new wonder drug comes out tomorrow. Physicians in Texas can go, that's awesome. Here's some training. You guys are authorized to do it starting tomorrow. California has to go to the legislature and say, you know, there's this really awesome drug. We would like to be able to use it. How long do you think that takes? So, but, you know, it's how the systems are set up. So it's basically kind of, there, there, there's, I mean, like it's, you know, it, it's nice in the fact that if you're in this little box and this other state has the same box, you just transfer. Where in Texas, if you're in this box, or, or basically if you're coming in and the roof's off the box, you may have to learn additional stuff. So like our Texas, the ECAs, know so much more than the typical first responder. You, you're a first responder, you come into Texas, you got to go back to school. You've got a lot of stuff that you need to learn because that wasn't part of the normal course. That's just the way they did it. So there's good and bad. Okay. Um, all right. So yeah, so it defines different levels of provider. We kind of talked about that. So it defines what's, what, what is different between those. Um, yeah, we said that in Texas is no defined scope of practice. Now, a question real quick. Yes, sir. I know with water and wastewater, we fall under Texas jurisdiction for TCEQ. But the only way we fall under TCEQ is the fact that all of TCEQ's codes are actually more stringent than the EPA code. <laughs> is it the same way here where there is a federal there is no generic scope? No, because the states, there's no federal, there's a federal standard for education. But basically the states have the right to change that because there's not, there's not a, you're going to take the National Registry, it's a private company. So there's no federal authority in that. So yes, yeah, so you take their test, Texas goes, we'll accept that test as evidence that you're competent and therefore when you give us your money we'll give you your certification. So there's not a federal jurisdiction because basically Texas only says this is what we do in Texas. There's not something national that says that we do national stuff. So like even the military. You can bounce around. There's nothing. The military basically has its own little kind of standard that's not done by everybody else. Because even the military folks kind of depending on what your assignment is as to what you actually kind of do. So, no, there's not a federal thing that we have to worry about because every state's a little bit different. So, some states, like Louisiana, basically it's all national registry. You, it's a national registry test and that's it. That's all the levels. That's the only thing they do. So, if you're a nationally registered paramedic, so you, as you, when you get your national registry, if you keep it, and five years from now you decide to move to Louisiana, you just go, hey, look, I'm a national registered UT. They go, okay, great, welcome. <laughs> so does that kind of answer your question? There's not a federal, there's the federal, the Department of Transportation, the National Highway Trans Transportation Safety Administration, under the DOT, <coughs> has a little EMS section, but it's kind of more, they don't do any sort of rule making process. They basically are there to kind of help with grants and help um, make sure across the country everything kind of flows. There, there's no, it's truly a bureaucratic process. I got a question. Yes. For the, um, once you go and take the, uh, what was it called, the NRA EMT? Mm -hmm. um, like, how long is it valid for when? Two, the NRMT is a two year cycle. So you go, you become certified, so we'll finish in where are we at? August. Mm -hmm. So you finish in August, you take the test in August, then you get it, so basically, so it's August 2011, so August, well actually National Registry does. So 2013? Yeah, it'll be basically 2013. Years. National Registry actually does everybody, everybody expires March 31st of whatever year. Okay. So they basically, they just said, in, 
as the Texas, your certification is actually good for four years. And theirs actually is from the mm -hmm. month that you get it. So if you get it in August, it basically expires four years from the month. Where National Registry will actually put you through, you may get shortchanged <coughs> in some cycle. Okay, so, so after those two years, you have to go in again and take another test? You, you can. You basically have to meet the recertification requirements. So there's a couple ways to do it. So you can basically get a certain amount of continuing education hours. Okay. So you go to courses and you get little certificates and you keep track of those and go, look, I got all this stuff. Or with them, you can actually go and take the test again. Or what else is here? I think that's it for them. Texas has like five ways to do it. You can become, if your company has a certain plan that's been approved by the Department of State Health Services and you follow their plan, they basically say you're good. If you've maintained your national registry, Texas says you're good. If you take the national registry exam, Texas <coughs> says you're good. If you've met Texas's CE requirements, which are different than national registry requirements, Texas says you're good. What am I missing? Oh, and then you can actually take a recertification course, and then they say you're good, and which is basically no continuing testing, education. I guess. Right. Okay. So, well, but in the course there's going to be testing. Right, right, right. right. But you don't have to go back to right. them right. and get that. So you could go back and take the test if you wanted to, but that's up to you. Right. So th there's different options. Okay. So let me ask you this. Also on the on the you know you got the application you got to go through the state of Texas <laughs> to be an EMT or a paramedic. Do you, how how long is that one for too? Not the National Registry, but your the application DHS for your for your um, EMT through the state health department. I think how how long does the application DHS. take? No, not take. How long is it good for after oh, the certification? Approved? Four years. Four years. Yeah, that's four years. Okay. Yeah, so National Registry is two. Texas is four. Okay. Is it like automatically as long as you're working? Or? No, you got to meet their whatever the current. And the standards change every couple of years. Somebody comes out and says, well, we should do this as opposed to this. Okay. But the current rules are to recertify, you have to meet those rules. So like with Texas, basically, typically what I do is I basically go, here's all my CE, take it. And then Texas, actually National Registry says, send me everything you got. And so if they audit me, they basically go and pull my file. Texas says, just sign a form saying that you legitimately did this. And so if then they, if it takes us audits me, then they go send me your forms after the fact. So National Registry just gets everything and they keep power of whatever percentage of it. Texas doesn't want all the paperwork. They only want the paperwork if they audit you. So when they audit a certain percentage of them every year, each group does. So. That, we good? <coughs> all right. Okay. So in Texas, the scope of practice. Again, this is what I was kind of talking about. The medical director, basically through the Texas Medical Practice Act, the medical director has the right to say what his folks can and cannot do. So it allows the physicians to delegate procedures to you. Okay. They do that through protocols, standing orders, or online processes. Okay. Protocols and standing orders are similar to each other in that it's a written document that you basically look at to say, this is what I'm allowed to do. Online is basically you pick up the phone and go, hey, doc, here's what I got. This is what I would like to do. Or if the doc is standing next to you and says, why don't you go ahead and do this, then that's an online order. Right? So you got paper, pre-printed paper stuff, and then you got somebody where you're actually having a conversation. Alright, so standard of care. Basically what this is, it, 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 this is kind of the exact kind of quote. It's how a reasonably prudent person with similar training and experience would act under similar circumstances with similar equipment and in the same place. So basically given the exact set of circumstances that you did, how would they act? <coughs> so taking a paramedic with 20 years experience, they can't fairly compare you to an EMT that just graduated from school. They should only compare you to an EMT who just graduated from school in that same system. They can't go and say, hey, the paramedics in New York did this. You didn't do that. So they should only go, hey, you know what? The other folks in your system, here's what you did. Right? So it's very much a 
similarly trained, similar experience, similar circumstances, similar equipment, similar place. Right. So yeah, so the police are coming and they're basically saying the gunman's coming, I think we should leave. And you pick up your patient and say, that sounds like a good idea to me. Right. So, but if the police aren't coming, you would pro maybe leave the patient there and actually take care of them there because by moving them, you may cause further damage. So they can't go back and say, well, you caused further harm. You know, they got to compare you to, well, yeah, when the cop is telling you to move, you better move. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Um, so, in local customs differ. How Scott and White does stuff is different than how Austin does it. It's different how Houston does it. Okay? Everybody's kind of got little different quirks based upon their local needs. Okay? So the protocols differ. Uh, what Dr. McGraw does here is different than what Dr. Benold does in Williamson County. So even though we're only 30 minutes away from each other, there are differences. Again, it's Medical Practice Act. Dr. McGraw says, this is what I want my people to do. Dr. Bernal goes, this is what I want my people to do. They've got different problems and different advantages to deal with. Okay. In Williamson County, it's an all paramedic system. In Temple, it's an EMT paramedic group. So that changes the game a little bit. Um, yeah. Talk about location, hazards, crowds, all that. Hopefully it kind of makes sense. Okay. Um, other things that look for care, right? So the American Heart Association. So if you do CPR properly or improperly, basically what you're going to be compared to is the national standard, which is the American Heart. Okay. So other folks make standards, right? The American Ambulance Association basically says this is how ambulances should be structured and done. NAEMT basically has ethical statements. Right? DSHS basically has their rules and say this is what we expect you guys to do. Okay. So all of these folks play a role in what you do. All right, institutional services regionally, and we kind of talked about that, right? So each service is different. Even at Scott and White, a, well, actually, we'll do this. So, y'all heard of MedStar, which is basically it's a system in Fort Worth. Yes. They actually have three levels of paramedics. So, Texas, basically, in Texas, you are a paramedic. MedStar basically says you're a paramedic one, paramedic two, paramedic three. So, a paramedic one is basically somebody that's just kind of a brand new paramedic, doesn't have a lot of experience. And they basically say, you can do this little bit. As you gain more experience and you demonstrate confidence, the medical director says, okay, I trust you. Now you can do a little bit more. And then to their supervisors, he says, okay, you guys have my best trust. You can do all of this stuff. So, supervisors can get there and do something that another paramedic can't. So, even local systems say who can and can't do. You'll see a lot of systems that basically have critical care paramedics and then regular paramedics. The critical care paramedics means they can do additional stuff that the regular paramedic can. So there's different levels and different training. So but all that should be defined very well by the system. Okay. So negligence. So we're talking about this earlier. Negligence is basically a civil problem process that you'll get into access to that. So I've talked about civil and criminal stuff. So what are the differences between a criminal law and civil law? Criminal law, you can go to jail. Absolutely, right? So criminal law, but basically, so if you violate a criminal law, what? give an example of a criminal law that you, that you can break. Shooting someone. Murder, else. right? Assault, murder, right? What about civil? What's a civil law? Civil law is if they were Guilty like no criminal law, then you can sue them for the for the um, well, so, okay. so everybody kind of remember OJ. So many OJ Simpson, right? Yes. OJ Simpson, did he was he convicted of a criminal law? No, no, no he was found innocent of that. Senior. What he right? So his family, the the family of Brown. I can't remember okay, yeah. So his. Her family sued him and yes. won that case. Right? So he wasn't found guilty under a criminal court, but under a civil court, he was found. So civil is individual to individual or company to individual to company or company to company. So it's a civil is basically, hey, you didn't treat me fairly or in accordance with what you have published as your standard. Criminal is you broke a law. 
So right, so I come and hit you, or I kidnap you, that's a criminal law. So I've assaulted you or taken away your, your, your rights. Civil is, you've mistreated me. So if I call you a bad name, right, and you go, that's not right, you can take me to court, but it's a civil case. It's not a criminal case. You're basically saying, hey, you defamed my name and character. This is a civil lawsuit. So civil is individual to individual. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Criminal is basically the state of Texas or the county or the government versus the individual. Okay. So in negligence, negligence basically is a civil matter. So with basically, you'll hear this stuff with simple or ordinary negligence or gross negligence. In Texas and most of the places now, actually, they basically negligence is negligence. But by gross negligence, generally what they mean is it's what they call is willful and wanted. Basically, it was in, it was horrible and intentional. Is another way to say it. So simple negligence is whoops, you know, hey, you're human, you made a mistake. We're still going to sue you, but you know, we recognize that. You know, when they say gross, they generally mean okay, what you did was intentionally wrong. It wasn't an accident. You you actually went out of your way to cause further harm or damage. So in order to prove negligence, there has to be a couple things. For a successful case, the lawyers must prove all of these things. Okay. Did we talk about this? No, we don't. All right. So you have to have a duty to act. Duty to act basically means, did you have a contractual responsibility? Okay. So if you're on the ambulance and you get called to go take care of somebody, and this is a true, it's in London, it's a true case. They decided <laughs> that no, it was tea time, <laughs> and they were going to have their tea first. <laughs> so I forget what happened anyway. It's London, so it's a different whole, different set of circumstances. But anyway, but basically, you're on duty. Do you have an obligation to respond? Yes. Would most folks say yes? You have an obligation to respond. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm a paramedic, or private citizen Jeff, and I'm driving home from class, and I see an accident on the side of the road. Do I have a contractual obligation with that individual on the road to stop? <coughs> Probably not with that individual, right. but... Right, so and that's what it basically means. Do I have a contractual obligation to stop? If I'm in an ambulance, in a, um, the responding agency, then yes, I have a contractual obligation, because basically that's my function. <coughs> If I'm even in my private vehicle and I'm on duty for the system, but I'm just doing business in my own truck, at the time I am working for that agency, I have a contractual obligation to respond. Okay, So that's what they basically look at. Did you have a duty to act? So if you didn't have a duty to act, case is over. Okay, so, yeah, so as a citizen, you stop in an accident, at least initially, you don't have a duty to act. Now, there have been some cases where they basically argued and said, you did stop, you did begin care, and then you backed out. They're basically saying, once you begin care, you are then now making a contractual obligation to that individual. So that's kind of a little gray area. So, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, please don't quote me on this. Um, I don't remember where I read it, but it was... I don't know if it was junior or with C, I don't know. Something about when you get CPR certified or you ha you see someone in that needs help, is it, and you have your, I mean, you have your card, you're certified. Do you have the obligation to help? No. Mm -hmm. I always, um, I, like I said. Now, we're getting, in, so this is, again, the legal thing. Right. Right? <clears throat> Ethically and morally, do you have an obligation? That's a whole separate matter. Right. Legally, no, you have no obligation to respond. Okay. Okay. So, but that—that's where it kind of gets. That's where folks get upset because they go, ethically, you stood up and said you're going to stop and help. Legally, they can't defend that. Yeah. Basically, that falls under the Good Samaritan law. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, and if you do, and I think that's probably coming up at some point here, if you do stop, there is a law that's designed to kind of protect you within reason. So if you stop and assist the <coughs> patient and you keep going until that ambulance come here, then you relieve until the ambulance what is going on and then you relieve it to the ambulance. Right. Are you mm -hmm. still 
At that point, you're, fine. you're, well, you're, the courts are kind of funny because it, you, you, you know, you think I'm ugly, you can actually go take me to court because you think I'm ugly. <laughs> that, that's the way the legal system is. So you can be sued for anything, <laughs> will it hold up in court? That's a whole separate matter. But you still got to go through the process. Okay? So Dr. Jarvis, who's our medical director, right? he got named in a lawsuit. And they actually went to the lawyers and said, we're happy with what you did. It, you, we think you did a wonderful job. We're not happy with what they are. But we're still going to sue you because that's what we want to do. And it's just the way the legal system is. The, you initially take that whole shotgun approach, and then you narrow down to, to the point. So, you know... Can you be sued? Yes. Are you still obligated for what it is? Yes. Is your, are, are we done? So when the Amos crew gets there, they should now take over care. Mm -hmm. So you are basically relieved at that point. But the only time that you can't pass anything off is when you're actually on duty, correct? I, I think I read it somewhere. Pass it off. Well, yeah. Well, we'll talk, about, we'll talk about transfer care here in a moment. Okay. What is going on? Okay. Um, okay, so we have a duty to act, okay? So, and then we had a breach of duty. Okay, so a breach of duty basically means we did something wrong. So we did something, right, so let's do this. So we did something we shouldn't have done. We didn't do something we should have done. I think that's it. All right, so those two terms. So, so if we go, hey, we should have put them on oxygen, but we didn't. Or they weren't breathing, but we put them on a, a, a non-rebreather mask. Okay, so... That's one where you did something wrong. You did do the, you did give motion. You just did the process wrong, or you didn't do it at all, and you should have done. Okay, so that's breach of duty. Okay, the other part is damages. So were there actual harm? Okay. So if I dropped the medication as I'm trying to give it back to moving in, was I dropped it? And I, it took me now. Now I gotta, un, I gotta throw away that needle, get a new needle, drop more medication. And it took me five minutes longer to give you pain medication. Okay. So were there damages done? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not. That's what they gotta kind of prove. Okay. So basically, damages. So because damages can be emotional, <coughs> physical, or basically. Look, did y'all hear? Did, did anybody? Did I? Oh, I might have been my class. I talked about it. Did y'all hear the other day where they basically sewed the leg back on backwards? Instead of the toes pointing forward, the toys were pointing backwards when they were done. Okay, so stuff like that where you're kind of going, okay. So yeah, so are there actual damages? Well, the foot's on, but you know, <laughs> is, there, is there an emotional process? Are they going to now have to go through more stuff? So can they sue them for negligence? Yeah, there's there's an emotional issue there that that, that individual was wrong. Okay. And then causation. So did this breach of duty cause this? Mm -hmm. okay. So if you can't prove that this caused this, then we're done. So basically we have to have all four of these in order to prove a successful, to have a successfully negligent, ne a successful negligence lawsuit brought. Questions on this? All right. Um, Fair to continue treatment. Okay, so abandonment. Basically, abandonment basically means we terminated care when the patient, when the care was still needed and the patient still wanted care. Okay. So now if the patient goes, you know what? I might be having a heart attack, but I don't want to go to the hospital. Go away. Leave me alone. That's not abandonment because a patient refused care. You go and the patient stubbed their toe. And you're going, you don't need care. Have an ice pack. Have a good day. Okay? That's not abandonment because the patient didn't need care. Okay. So there's some sort of paperwork, I'm sure there is. Oh, there's all sorts of paperwork. In fact, to me, refusals are the worst paperwork to write because that's where you're going to get in trouble. So taking somebody to the hospital, transporting them, everything, things, that's easy because I just, there, there's not as much, I'm not as concerned legally about the issues. 
It's basically encouraged them to. <coughs> Let me do this. So, as an EMT, you have very recognize you got to recognize the limitations. You have very little knowledge. That limited knowledge can get you in trouble sometimes. So, I don't want to. As you gain more experience, you can kind of get a better grasp of when that's needed and when that's not. Getting them to go to the hospital isn't necessarily always the best thing. Anybody else been up to Scott and White lately? Mm -hmm. So, how long did you sit there? Really long time. Okay. Right. So and that's why. So basically, because if we bring in somebody that has stitches, that takes up a bed and takes up space. Is there another place that we can take them that maybe we can get the stitches done to where that big trauma center is actually isn't overwhelmed with stitches? So is there a clinic? Can they go to the personal physician? What are the other? I mean, so we got to kind of look at it from a broader perspective. So, as a system, what's the best way to take care of this patient? So. Yeah, all right. So, abandonment is basically termination of care without the patient's consent, termination of care without provision for continuing care. Right. So, if you go to the hospital, right, so we transport the patient, we leave them at the hospital. We give our report to the nurse, we leave. We didn't abandon the patient, right? So we made a provision for continuing care. Okay. So maybe they called because they have an a, a upper respiratory infection. Well, we set them up with an appointment to go see the primary care physician, doctor tomorrow, and we gave them some antibiotics tonight to get them through the day. That's not abandonment because we set them up for continuation of care. We just shifted the burden to somebody else. That makes sense? Alright. Uh, all right. So many of examples, yeah, so failure to transport. So you're there and um, somebody's having some chest pain and this horrible disastrous plane crash occurs <coughs> two blocks away. And you go to the wife and go, hey, we gotta go to that horrible disastrous wreck. Take your husband in the car to the hospital. Was the care needed? Yes. Was there a provision for continuing of care? Yes. No. Um, yeah, because it, it, you basically stopped it and said, pick it up later. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So part of this, too, is we have to hand over care to somebody who's capable of doing it. So a paramedic starts an IV, pushes several drugs, hooks them up on a cardiac monitor, and then says to the EMT, you go ahead and take care of this. So is that continuing of care? Right. So we drop down to the level of care. That EMT no longer is able to take care of that stuff. Right? So basically what we have to do is transfer care to a similar <coughs> level. Right? EMTs can transfer to EMTs. EMTs can transfer to paramedics. EMTs can transfer to ECAs as long as it's within their area. EMTs are physicians, EMTs are nurses. Okay? So what about, so I'm a paramedic, I stop. You're on the ambulance, and basically the guy's got a broken arm, and so basically I split it, and I'm ready for you, and I say, here you go, have a good day, see ya, I'm out of here. Is that continuation of care, or is that a drop in care? So I hear a drop, and I hear continuation. What do you think? Can you repeat that? So, yeah, there you go, right? So basically all I did was split it, Right, so it's a BLS skill, so it's something you guys are trained to do. I haven't started any medications. I haven't done anything that you're not capable of doing. It's a continuation of care. And you see it all the time, because the paramedics and EMTs, the EMTs ride in with a lot of patients. Because that paramedic basically goes, hey, this is a call that you can handle. I haven't initiated anything above your level of care. You can now handle this call and take it in. Does that make sense? All right, uh, consent, all right. So in order to treat the patient, we gotta get consent, right? Because if I come up and I touch you without your permission, what is that called? Harassment. Sexual. Assault. Uh, assault. Assault, right. So I guess you can call it assault, right? So, <laughs> somebody do it, right? So if I'm just touching you appropriately, we'll just say on the top of the head. 
Okay. Yeah, so I'm touching you appropriately on the top of the head. Yeah, so that is, that's assault, and I don't have your permission. Okay. So in order to treat patients, even just to interact with them, you need to get their care, their consent. So when you come in, and now generally most folks will say, well, they called for help. Okay. And you got to recognize who called for help. Did they call for help? Did their family call for help? Who called for help? Do they want help? So that's where we got to walk in and kind of go, okay, so what's happening here? What's going on? Do you want me to take care of you? Yes. Okay, great. So let's go. So this it gives you permission to take care of it. And again, you have to have this to do it. All right, so there's different types of consent. Express consent, applied consent, and voluntary consent. Okay. So if you come up and say, hey, you look like you're in pain, do you want me to help you out? And I say yes, then you have ex excuse me, express consent. Oh, there we go, okay, so we that. Right, so it's spoken or communicated, so it's expressed, right? If you're in a lot of pain and, and I go, you look like you're in a lot of pain, do you want my help? And I go, okay. did I communicate to you yes. that you yes. want help? Yes. If I write yes, I've communicated to you. So that's any sort of communication that provides that, that's the care, okay? Now the other part must be informed, right? I can't just come up. So <laughs> anybody has any sort of surgical procedure done? Mm -hmm. All right, so they pull out this big long form and basically say, you may die. We may accidentally sew your foot on backwards. We may accidentally <laughs> cut off the wrong foot. We may, there's all sorts of stuff, right? So they basically have to give you the warnings, right? Whenever we do that, whenever we provide care, we need to do the same thing. So even just something simple like, which, you know, starting an IV, which is not what you guys do, but basically it happens every day. Thousands and thousands of IVs are started every day, but there's still risks. So, hey, look, I'd like to start an IV. It's going to cause a little, you know, it might hurt a little bit. It might cause some infection. It could theoretically cause an inner bubble, which could cause complications inside. I need to provide you the risks because if I don't tell you the risks, and later something happens, you may you may go back and say, "I changed my mind." If you would have told me that, I wouldn't have done that to begin with. So you have to inform them of the risks, the benefits, the alternatives to what you want to do. Okay. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, in basically, really, truly, every time you do anything. So, hey, I want to put you on the backboard and see call. Here's why I want to do it. Are you good with that? Okay. So, express consent. So, in Texas, the legal age is 18. So, they have to be 18. Or, if they're married. Or, if they're pregnant and the care is in relation to the baby. Okay. So, you have a 15-year-old that's pregnant. She has a right to give consent for care if it's relating to the baby. So, but to say that she's going to get an immunization, you have to have her parents' permission to get the immunization. <coughs> so it gets kind of complicated sometimes. How does that work if her parents are around say she's like... We'll, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah, so yeah, let's come up. Yeah. So they're in the armed services, but at least, which doesn't really apply anymore because now you got to be 18 to be in the armed services, but you don't? Cool. Yeah. No. 17-year-old delayed entry. Really? The guys that are juniors in high school sign up for the entry. <laughs> they go to basic training between the seven, they're, when they're 17, junior year, go to basic training, come out of basic training, finish senior year in high school, go to AIT. And well, all right then. Okay, so if they're in the armed services and they're 17, <laughs> there you go. Got it. Or they're emancipated. What does emancipated mean? Married, you somebody, are given the right to be responsible for yourself. Right. So a court has said, parents, you now have a right to take care of yourself. So I want to say like Macaulay Coughlin or somebody anyway got emancipated many, many years ago. So there are cases where the courts go, okay, you want to take care of yourself? Fine, go for it. Okay, so but basically it's a court where they say. So, but again, we got to, that, that, we're not necessarily in the situation to prove all that. So sometimes it gets complicated, and sometimes we're calling for the supervisor to help us figure all this stuff out. Okay. All right. So now, the patient's unconscious. Can they give us express consent? Implied consent. Right. It's implied consent. Right. So then it becomes implied consent. So if they can't, we can't get express consent. So say they have a, a stroke. They can't answer us. They can't respond. We may treat them under an idea called implied consent, which basically means we assume that the normal person would want to to get care that would take care of their situation. 
Okay, so if they're unconscious, they're not able to give express consent, then this works. Okay. So the kid that you were talking about, we can't get a hold of the parents, in which we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but basically it comes under implied consent. So we have an emergency. I want to take care of the kid. I can't get a hold of the parents. Under implied consent, I can take and transport the kid and treat the kid. All right, but we'll get them more. Involuntary consent is basically the court or some or you are a ward of the state. Okay. So you have been institutionalized <coughs> in one of Texas's finer criminal justice systems. Okay. You have lost your ability, legally lost your ability, to make decisions for yourself. Now they will still probably defer to you what you want to do, but theoretically they can force you to do what they what whoever is in charge of you says. So this can be ordered by a magistrate. Okay? So basically, if you have tuberculosis and you have active tuberculosis, a judge will say, you will take this or we will give it to you. And they actually have public <coughs> health officers that go around and basically say, take your medicine or you're coming with me. Kind of okay. So it's ordered by a magistrate. So basically, if they've been arrested, that police you are now awarded of the state, the police officer now has that right, whoever is responsible for you has that right to make the decisions for you. So again, they kind of walk a thin line because they kind of, they're not going to force you to do something unless, and typically where this comes into play is you're not of sound mind and you're saying no, 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 where they basically go, I can solve this, you're under arrest because you're not of sound mind, <coughs> now treat him. And we go, thank you. And then we can treat him and fix the cause and fix whatever it is, and then you go later, he goes, oh, okay, yeah. Is that clearly a mental retardation person? Yes, so it can be, so it depends on how it w w works. So they can be a ward of the state, or the state saying make those decisions. Um, what if you have a mental retardation that doesn't understand what you're talking about and there's no police officer around? Who, so hopefully it's kind of been set up in advance, because yeah, so say, just to say, he's walk across the street. Uh, or right. Kind of ultimately, ultimately, kind of depends truly on the nature of it. So, if we look at it and truly go, you're going to die if they don't have treatment. You know, he's not making right decisions. Then we can, I can call the police and say, he's not. Obviously, he's not making right decisions. And the police can go, yes, I agree. He's. And they can find some cause to arrest him, and then we can get it. Or if it's kind of basically like a you know, suicide where there's not, is not an imminent threat, there's a whole other process to go through to get a judge to say, yes, he's, y'all can do this. So there's, there's several kind of, but it's a very tricky minefield. So. <coughs> Out of curiosity, how does that work? Like, say a person went into someone's house with a weapon and was shot, there's probably something that happens in Texas. Um, they're they're now a gunshot victim. They get for some reason they're dumb. Call the police. Call nine one one. After just robbing, trying to rob someone's house. I don't know why you do that, but um, so that they haven't been arrested yet. If the EMS gets there first, can you start treatment? I imagine Does the never person mind. say? Yeah, I as want you treatment. say, they probably so that's treatment. Yeah. yeah, I'm just kidding. I was trying to throw you for a loop there. <laughs> I was trying to think of a challenge. I was trying to think of the most challenging question I could. And just made, my, made myself look stupid. Alright, so we got that. Alright, so that kind of makes sense. The involuntary consent. Okay. Alright, so again, patients have a right to their own judgment of what they want. They have a right to refuse. So if I've had folks <laughs> that I go in, the chest pain, shortness of breath, hey, you're having a heart, you're, you're going to die. You're having a big MI. Where the family's basically called us and he doesn't want to go. Oh, leave me alone. I don't want to go. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. You're having an MI. You're going to die. I don't care. Leave me alone. Okay, so we go through this. Right? Sign here. Sign here. And of course the family's getting upset at us because we're going, I can't. Because if I take him, it's kidnapped. Even though they want me to take him. He has the right to that decision. Okay. So ultimately what happened is we went back an hour later, he was dead, we did CPR. 
So, but he had that right. Everybody around him was going, come on. I mean, this is not hard here. <coughs> Pardon? Did you go three blocks away? No, right? No, because we went back because it was, it was actually we went back to our, our it was in our response district. We just went back to our station. Oh, so you went back to the gas station later? Okay, so so living wills <coughs> is what we'll, I think that's that's coming up. So we'll get there. Yeah, because there's a section on kind of living wills about who has. So if you're unable to make decisions for yourselves, you can give that authority to somebody else. So, yeah, so it's come. As for the minors good. as well, minors. So, well, minors basically the parents have that and authority. The parents don't want you to help the child. Right. Yeah. You can't do that. So oh, yeah. So he broke his leg, and you're there, and it's kind of like, yeah, I'd like to take him to the hospital. And, no. Is there a point where CPS would get involved? In that? Yes. If you basically any time that you kind of go, this isn't right. I'm not sure that this, this is correct then you can call CPS and make a case. And as long as you're doing it a legitimate concern, there's there's limitations to kind of how they can come back at you. Meanwhile, your kid is down. So, right. Yeah. So, but if you basically look at it and go, wait a minute, this isn't right, so then you can still get law enforcement involved. But ultimately, it does come down to cultures a lot of times. They truly believe that this isn't right. So, Jehovah, anybody Jehovah Witness? Jehovah Witnesses do not believe in receiving blood flow. So they lose two gallons of blood, even though there's a huge blood bank there, we could replace it, and you're going to go about your business. They choose not to receive it. You lose two gallons of blood, you're in the negative, buddy. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, but they choose not to receive it. Is it right? Well, that's kind of a moral thing. I mean, they truly believe it a part of their religion. That there's a there's a scripture that says something along those lines, and that's how they have interpreted. It. You know, you've got to kind of go, oh, okay, and especially when you're looking at it from a kid, you're kind of going, this, you know, I can fix this, I, I can I can do that, I can help you here, but they're going, no, this is not what we believe. This is not the way that we want it to happen. And so there's a lot of different cultural variations that it's hard to do. you got to be respectful to that. And, and it's hard because it's hard to put yourself outside of your own culture and understand. So. <coughs> All right. So let's see. So patient refusal. So th th they can do that. Right? So again, there's a big thing. So you got to inform them of the alternatives, risk, benefits. Right? So, you know, the guy that I was talking to is going, look, you can, you may die of this. You may lose a significant portion of your heart. You could spend the rest of your life in a nursing home. You could be required to have a, a device that supports your heart. Are you sure you don't want to go? Okay. The alternative would be to you drive yourself. The family drives you. Don't want to, what, what, you know, I can go to a different hospital. What do you want, you know, how can I make this work? So we go through all those terms. And the big thing is that all of that stuff gets documented. So, and then you got a signature, get a signature, then you got to get somebody to witness it that says that they saw it. All righty, so, yeah, so we talked about that. Get family members involved, try to encourage them. You can try to get law enforcement involved. A lot of times the medical, even though you've talked to your blue in the face, you pick up the phone and go, hey doc, this person doesn't want to go, you know, talk to them. And they go, you should go. Oh, okay, I'll go. And you go, okay. <coughs> Note to self, call the doctor next time. The patient's unconscious. Early. And the only family members that are around are not the mom and dad, but say brother or sister, cousin, aunt, uncle, can they so give? An adult or a kid? Uh, Okay, so who's there? Uh, well, I'm trying to base it on one of the test questions I looked over last night. Okay, well, yeah, because I think for the kids, we're going to come up. Because, yeah, because we'll address who actually has the authority to give okay. consent for kids. Okay. So, yeah, we good. Okay. Um, yeah, so when in doubt, kind of err in the favor. You know, if you're, you know, I would rather be taken to court 
for kidnapping and trying to justify that than taking the court for abandoning a patient. So sometimes you kind of got to go, where's the lesser of the two evils here? If I kidnap them, then I can kind of go, you know, here's, here's my perspective. And allow a jury to kind of go, yes or no. So. Okay, so the minor consent. So here's the ones you're talking about, right? So basically, a minor is anybody that's under 18, hasn't been married, not in the, not in, basically doesn't meet the right to be in that law, right? So actual consent can be given by the parents, okay? Their legal guardian, <coughs> grandparents, adult brothers and sisters, and adult uncles. So those are the only folks that can give. So they have a brother and sister who's not of age, they can't give consent. Okay? Cousins can't give consent. Sister twice removed from whatever can't give consent. This, these are the folks in Texas that can give consent. Okay. And this guardian, the other part of the guardian, like so if you go to the school, <coughs> the administration there can give consent because basically the parents have given them the right to say yes. Okay. Now that typically doesn't mean that they have the right to refuse care because they're typically only granted permission to give consent. They're not granted decision-making ability. So if they say they feel that it's needed, which probably is because they called you, they have that right to say, yes, you can transport the kid, even though we can't get a hold of the parents. I was going to say something. <laughs> All right. So minor, implied consent, life or limb threatening. So basically we can go, hey, this is significant. If I don't transport and treat them, <laughs> there will be a negative outcome. So they stub their toe and maybe their toe's broken, you're kind of going, you know, we need to make a very valiant effort to find the parents. They've been hit by a car, I'm not even going to look for the parents, we're going, because that's a life threat. Okay? So that kind of, so we get life or limb, we can make the decision. So ultimately I can't find the parents, I've tried very hard, we've tried all the contacts, he's got a broken toe. What do you want to do? How are we going to get there? What are we? Yes. So now maybe we go. Okay. So, but but again, you gotta you've got to go through those processes because by transporting that kid, I'm on the borderline. So do can they sue me for kidnapping? Sure, because I didn't actually have their permission to transport. And can they argue that it wasn't limb threatening? You have a broken toe. You're probably not going to lose your toe. So but then we kind of got to go, how do we, we can't, I can't necessarily leave them there because that's abandoned. So at that point, I'm kind of between a rock and a hard place. So you kind of got to, so that's where the system comes into play. How do we make those decisions? Do we get the police involved? Do we get the medical director involved? There's all sorts of ways to kind of go through that process. Can we get verbal consent over the phone? Absolutely. Yeah, that would be express consent. Yep. So yeah, I go, hey, hey, mom, I got, and I've had like for school bus accidents, we've had that. So, look, hey, look. Johnny was on the school bus. Johnny's fine. You're talking to Johnny. Wonderful. I want to go to the hospital. Wonderful. Let's go. Meet him there. <coughs> yeah. So what happens if you have implied consent from a child who's, life or, who's, <coughs> who's in a life or limb threatening condition and he's just a Jehovah's Witness <coughs> and his parents aren't around? Well, I, I cop out. Her. I'm copying out because I don't carry blood. <laughs> <laughs> so, but if I, I again. yeah, but I think where that where again that kind of comes down to, what does the patient want? If the, is the patient able to say, hey, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I don't want that, even though he doesn't necessarily have that legal authority. I'm probably going to respect that. Gotcha. So. You know, but that not, but it would still be. I would call up my because if I'm expecting my medical director says <laughs> you will give blood, I need to call up him and go, hey, look, I'm deviating. Here's why I'm deviating. Unless you tell me to do so, um, this is this is what I'm thinking. So it ultimately put that decision on him. Gotcha. So that's the advantage. Of a paramedic, you can defer. <laughs> you decide. So. 
All right, so refusals of minors, again, basically the same process, right? We got to basically talk to the parents. We got to get informed. We basically got to give them and give them the ability to make decisions. So um, we tell them what can happen, the good things, the advantages, the disadvantages, and what are the alternatives. Okay. Uh, mentally competent. We talked about that. Informed injury, illness, benefits, obtain <laughs> signatures. So we're getting that. So retain signatures, parents, and witnesses. How about that? Witnesses should probably not should be some neutral third party. So your partner witnessing that you said all this. Although it works, if you have a police officer there who's kind of neutral, who signs it, that's probably a little bit stronger in court. Okay. So, yes, so, so, yes. I'm, this doesn't really relate, but I've kind of been curious about this. Would you perform CPR on a patient with an open wound? I don't know. Define. So, big hole in the head, brain no. pouring out? No, it's just like, say, they're. They've got a bad cut in their arm, and there's a reason they're or they're not breathing. And yes, because basically, which well, okay. and, and and there's uh, there's a process yeah, to, there's a, there's a process to go through to get to the end point of do we transport and how do we get there? So I need to go through. If we're going through the treatment and I've made the decision <laughs> that they're possibly viable, then yes, I can go through that those steps. So it's not such clear, but yes, we could. We just got to be able to kind of say the first decision to be: is it, is it, is is there a reason why I shouldn't start this to begin? With? Is there so like big hole in head where I'm going? That's not that injury is not compatible with life. Big hole here, okay, injury is not compatible with life. Right. So with that where you kind of go, okay, no matter what I do. That's not fixing. A bullet wound here, can I put a tourniquet on, start CPR, get fluids, and maybe make a difference? Yes. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. All right. So, all right. So, we talked a minute ago about assault and battery, right? So, assault is putting the person in fear. Battery is actually touching. Now, Texas, in Texas, doesn't have battery. They just have assault. They basically, Texas law basically says assault is either the threat or the actual touching. Nationwide, there's assault, which is a threat, battery, which is a touching. So you need to know battery for this, for the, the nation, but in Texas, I understand that people are just going to say they've been assaulted. Hmm. You know that it says topping, technically? I'm oh, sure it does. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so, okay, so immunity to prosecution. Okay. So again, earlier I was saying, you can sue me or I can sue you because I think you're ugly, or vice versa. Okay. So you can get sued for anything. Okay, so Dr. Jarvis is being dragged into court, and they're not really interested in suing him. But he's got to go through all this process. He's got to talk with his lawyers. He's got to go through all their process, all their documentation. <laughs> they got to get all the records. They got to get all the dissertations, all that stuff. Okay. So this stuff is immunity to lawsuits, but it still means you still have to go to court. So y'all talked about the Good Samaritan law earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can't stand up when they sue you and go Good Samaritan law. <laughs> you, right? you got to hire the lawyer to go to court to say. I don't think this applies because they were, this falls under the Good Samaritan Law. This case should be dismissed. And then they argue about the Good Samaritan Law, and then maybe the case gets dismissed or not. Okay? So don't think this is kind of like, this isn't the get out of jail free card. This isn't the get out of the lawsuit free card. This is an offensive <coughs> prosecution. Okay? So the Good Samaritan Law. What, 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 actually, let's do this. So the government, actually the government and the government's wisdom basically says, you can't sue the government unless you grant the permission of the federal government. So yeah, so you can't actually sue the government unless you go to a judge and say, give me permission, please, to sue the federal government because they screwed up here. What about, what about the counties? The, state. the states and the counties, depending upon how the state law read, may or may not have. In the state of Texas, can you sue the county? Yeah. I'm not sure. So, and I think most judges, because basically most judges are going to kind of look at it and say, yeah, you're me. 
or, or th there's some validity because they basically have to kind of you know because if you disagree, then it goes to the appeal court and they basically say yeah. So most of them are trying to, at least kind of within the limits of what they're saying is is there validity to those cases or not. So okay. Now the Good Samaritan law. The Good Samaritan law basically applies to you under certain circumstances. Okay. If you're on duty, it historically doesn't apply to you. So you're working for an animal service and you, and you do something wrong, you can't claim good surrender. Okay. <coughs> so again, we talked about it doesn't prevent lawsuits. It does offer a defense. Um, and generally it doesn't offer. So if you wantonly, intentionally do something wrong, that's where they basically kind of say this doesn't fall under good surrender. But the good surrender law does basically kind of say if you stop, you act in the patient's best interest, then there's this defense of prosecution. So you're off duty, this applies. On duty, typically. <coughs> All right, so living wills and means directive. This is what they were talking about earlier, where they were saying, okay, so I have an actually, I've executed a advanced directive, basically is what it is, where basically I have signed a legal document that basically says my wife if I become incapacitated, it has the decision making, it has the ability to make decisions for me in both medical and financial matters. Okay. So if I ever become brain dead for whatever reason, she can pull this out and go, I have the decision to do what I want, you know, or act in his best interest. Okay. So folks do that. So parents a lot, so as your parents get older, they may give that decision making authority to you. Um, if kids get, or well, if kids with parents get there, spouses can do it. Um, but watch, there's different ones. There's ones for financial. There's advanced directives for finance. There's advanced directives for healthcare. They'll, they're not necessarily interchangeable. So watch which ones they are. Okay. Um, generally, these things need to be present. They can't just say I have it. You got to go show me the money. And you got you to see the document. And you look at it. So again, we're not lawyers, but you can look at it and kind of go, in my judgment, this seems to be a properly executed document. Okay, so therefore, what do you want to do? Let's go to this head. Okay. Um, and there are watch, because like the DNR, there's an in-hospital DNR and there's an out-of-hospital DNR. The in-hospital DNR doesn't work, obviously, out of the hospital. So because they have a DNR while they're at Scott and White, when they pull it out, it says Scott and White in hospital DNR. That's not about DNR outside that facility. Okay, so watch how watch them. So the, the DNRs are the only ones that are really kind of quirky like that. Okay. What, uh, let me ask this: on the DNR, if you're picking up a patient from a nursing home and they're in the field, to transport them to a, say, a doctor's or whatever, and their folder has it written on their top DNR. Is that document has to be in that folder too? A, or a copy of it has to be there. Okay. So, or so the DNR, there's a couple things. Because in Texas, you can actually have a wristband that says DNR that basically gives that same authority. There's actually <coughs> some jewelry that says Texas DNR. Um, so you can have, a, again, so a wrist a bracelet, a, a necklace that says DNR. But basically, when you flip it over, kind of like the, the medical alert tags, when you flip it over, it says Texas DNR. That's a valid statement. So that right there is a valid statement. Okay. So as long as it belongs to that person. So as long as your neighbor didn't go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Confusing question. If you show up and it's not like that and the patient's DNR and they're also an organ donor, do you still take the body or does somebody else complete the body? You, well, Oh, I don't know how that works. <laughs> That's going to get into how the local organ process works. Um, because ultimately, so I'm not asking any questions. I'm sorry. be an organ donor, that basically supersedes the DNR. Okay. Because if they're dead, I've got to perfuse the organs yeah. to keep the organs alive so that they're... Because especially now in Texas, because if you're on the list, you're on the list. And then, then they don't even ask family. So you're on the Texas list, they look you up, he's an organ donor, go. Because they don't even go talk to the family. Well, they do eventually. <laughs> <laughs> what if someone's 
Uh, actually, well, search for I Texas organ donor. I forget there's an organization that does it. Um, Basically, whenever whenever you redo your license now, yeah. th there's now a database. Yeah. Uh -huh. So the hospitals have access to the database. So when they pull it up, they can actually see. <coughs> yes, that's you. And that's it. So, um, so the advanced directives. That's what we're talking about. The power of attorney for healthcare DNR stuff. Okay. All right. So here's a couple key things. All right. DNRs become invalid as soon as the patient becomes pregnant. Which, while well, they had one to begin with, I don't know, but anyway, well, they became pregnant, that invalidates the DNR. Alrighty. Basically, there's weird circumstances. Now you're thinking this is a homicide. There's something going on that invalidates the DNR. Okay. Um, the form's not signed correctly. Okay. In general, this kind of gets difficult sometimes because the families may kind of. <coughs> Yes, there's a DNR. No mom said she didn't deny because basically, as soon as they can execute the DNR, all they have to say is the DNR is invalid. Okay, and it's terminated. So now, if somebody's saying the DNR is invalid, you got you may have siblings who are going, "Mom signed the DNR." No, she didn't. She's terminated it. You've got to work through that little minefield. Okay, so and there's a couple which I mean, in doubt, treat deal with it later. Basically what we're doing is punting, going to the hospital and letting the doctors and the lawyers go figure this stuff out. <laughs> Hopefully that doesn't end up with you hanging out with the lawyers. Pardon? Hopefully that doesn't end up with you hanging out with yeah. the lawyers. So. Yeah. Alright, so yeah, so there's the text of stuff where you kind of see the, the stuff where it talks about. Um, organ donor stuff. So again, this is becoming a, a database. This is becoming much more significant. You're seeing lots of folks that basically where one individual, although it's tragic, can actually help 8, 10, 12 other families. So they're starting to kind of gear up because they're recognizing the value of this. So, but as the system, the system needs to kind of work through it and figure out how to make it work. Each place is kind of a little bit different about how to access all this stuff. Uh, records are reports. So with all the legal stuff, it needs to be accurate and complete. Okay, anybody have horrible scribble? Who you can't read your own handwriting? Okay. So multiply that times five years because when they go to court, they're going to wait five years before they ever even sue you. And now you're trying to decipher your own handwriting. You need to be able to read it. If it if it's legible, you may actually stay out of court because if the lawyers can read it and go, well, I don't want to talk to him. You may stay out of court. Okay? If it's completed, if it's a well-written document, again, that's the reason why you're going to stay out of court. So being legible, neat. Okay? And again, basically, if it looks like a sloppy report, that's a reflection of the care that you provided. Because that's their, their impression of your care is based on this report. If there's little coat stains and coffee stains and all sorts of stuff, they're going to go, what else happened when it's called? We need to really look at this and figure out what's going on. Is it a lot of computerized now, or is it still a paperwork? It's very, very much moving to a computer electronic document. Okay. So there's still some that are paper-based, very much moving to computer-type documents. So most of the paper-based is most like volunteer departments and stuff. That, well, yeah, because the bigger systems have the finances to, to get to. So, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, and the other big thing, if, it, if you didn't <coughs> document it, you didn't do it. So even though you may have splinted their leg, if you didn't talk, talk about in your report that you splinted it, you didn't do it. That's your evidence. So make sure that you write down all the key stuff that you did. All right, patient gets confidentiality. There's a federal law, it's the HIPAA, so I forget what it is, but anyway, it basically protects patient privacy stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't want your medical records strewn about the community. <coughs> you have a right to have that information protected. So basically what it means is you can't go sharing this information. You can't go back to the station and say, hey, guess what Mrs. Jones has. Okay. You can't go to church and go, hey, I picked up your neighbor the other day. How, you know, they you know, had syphilis or whatever. Okay. <laughs> you, you, you've got to recognize where the lines are. 
So basically, if a person doesn't need to know, and they don't have a legitimate business right knowing, so the other crews that are at the station, the oncoming shift, do they don't have a legitimate business knowing, you don't need to talk about identifying information. There's nothing wrong with coming back to class going, hey, man, I had this great call. Patient got did the, 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 as long as you don't identify the patient. Um, what if um, what if it's somebody that you know? Um, this is probably just a judgment call, but if it's if it's somebody that you know, or maybe somebody you haven't seen in a long time, but you see someone on a regular basis who knows that person as well and sees them on a regular basis, does that make sense? Could you ask the so person? There's a third party. There's a third party. Could you ask that person how the other patient is doing? Not giving any details about the situation that went on. So could you come up and play dumb and go, hey, how's Joe doing? Hadn't seen yeah. Joe in a while. Yeah. As long as you're not giving them information, it's okay. So again, because if you're going, you know, hey, I picked up Joe the other day. How's he doing? Okay. You just violated Joe's rights. But if you come up and go, hadn't seen Joe in a while. How, how's he doing? You heard anything? Then they can come back. Yeah, he told me you picked him up. Okay. So now. Gotcha. They, yeah. So, but again, kind of watch how much because. Just because they told you, or you, that person knows that you picked them up, Doesn't they don't know all the information. Because he may not remember that he picked you up. Kind of the trauma. Right. So again, so recognize that you know, yeah. So can you go, hey, how you know, hadn't seen Joe, well, how's it going? Okay. But yeah, so as long as you're not giving out that information or giving hints that that occurred. Um, so what's protected? So basically anything that relates back to that individual. So anything that identifies the individual. So we can talk in here all day long about hypothetical or about cases, as long as I don't tell you the date of the transport, the name of the patient, the area to where you can kind of go back and go, yeah, I remember that call, that was over there, and identify the specific place. Okay. And basically their health information is protected. Allergies, habits, conditions, diseases, Diagnosis, all that's protected. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, right. So, reputation, professionalism, service, in general, yeah. So, this is a big PR thing, right? Because this is not what you want plastered on the paper. Local EMS system discusses patients' problems with the community. That, that's not what you want. All right. So who can it be released to, right? Anybody that's essential for continuum of care. So when you get to the hospital, you can go, hey, this is Mr. Smith. Here's what we did. Here's the problem that we found. It's a continuation of care. Okay. It's requested by a judge. So not the police walk in there and go, hey, man, come on, was he drunk? Tell me, tell me if he was drunk so I can go, so I can go fill out the paper. I don't want to go through the heading of the judge. When the judge says, here's the subpoena, that's when you can say, okay. And that gets hard because we try to have a good relationship with the cops, but they need to be ethical about how they do it. Okay. Um, it's required for billing purposes. Okay. So yes, so we, company X, bills for ambulance service XYZ, company X needs to have that information in order to bill on our behalf. So they can pass it along. So that's a legitimate business purpose. Okay. Obviously, if they get subpoenaed, that makes sense, right? So a judge should give it to us. Um, or when the patient says that we can release it. So the patient wants a copy of the report, but they're sending out their son to come pick it up. So the patient needs to sign the form that says the son can get the document. All right, so special reporting stuff. So any childbirth, child abuse, childbirth is a state thing, they got to track it, so there's special forms that you get. If you suspect actually any sort of abuse, so elder abuse, child abuse, you need to report it. In Texas, the way the law reads, any individual who knows of abuse needs is expected to report the abuse. So if you go to the hospital and go, hey, will you call CPS because I really think this is abuse? And they go, sure. Even if they called, you didn't report it. You then are in violation of criminal law. So, yes, basically what they're saying is they want 
20 reports. So as the ambulance crew, you go back and call the station, call the CPS, and then go, here's what happened, here's the story, because they're trying to piece together all the pieces. So um, so there's an adult protective service and child protective <coughs> services. Those are the folks we got to report to. Okay? Um, and again, we're not, we're, we should basically be documenting our observations. Don't call it, go, it's abuse. Go, you know, Billy had funny bruises. Billy looked like he had cords marks, he had these weird things on his arm that just didn't seem right to me. Okay, so you report what you observe, not your opinion. Okay. Let me ask this, if your report says that, <coughs> and then your physician says it is not that, could that be a little... But, but you reported in good faith. So basically what, what they're saying, this last one is, okay, so there's some immunity there. They want you, they want folks over-reporting. So if they go through it and they say, this is an abuse, this is actually a cultural variation, it's acceptable to them, okay. So they just say, okay. Okay, so elder abuse, the same thing. Uh, Drug-related injuries, yep, so we can't talk about all that. All right. Crime <coughs> scenes, so do, are we involved in a lot of crime scenes? Give me an example. Absolutely, there you go, right? So car accidents are crime scenes. We get them all the time, right? So yeah, so there's a lots of times where you get involved in crime scenes, okay? So your documentation kind of needs to reflect a little bit of that. So what happened to the scene, what preserved, you know, what was, what was occurring? If there's evidence, so there's a shooting, you need to try to preserve any sort of evidence, right? Because now with CSI stuff, right? They're looking for little hair fibers. Okay. So recognize that. Don't go stomping in mud all over the place. Okay. If, if there's a gunshot wound here, don't cut through the gunshot wound. Cut around the gunshot wound. Okay. So we'll get more into that later. Obviously, call the police. Okay. Sexual assault's the same. We've got to report to law enforcement. Again, trying to protect the evidence. Um, folks that are dead on scene. Okay. You basically need to report why you feel that they're dead or document why you feel that they're dead. We need to contact the coroner, medical examiner, or whatever the process is. City, some cities actually have a coroner or medical examiner's office where they have folks that come out. The counties that don't have justice of the pieces that come out and investigate. So it ultimately kind of depends on where you're at. Okay. Um, so, but anyway, there's a process to get through it. So if it's outside of a any sort of facility like a hospital, law enforcement needs to be involved. So we call law enforcement, they come and they basically go, this doesn't look like a crime scene. We go, he looks like he's dead. And then the justice of the peace goes, okay. And they decide kind of how they proceed from there. Okay. Um, but in general, don't disturb or move the body again. Kind of the police need to make their judgment about, is this a crime scene, is this not? And that's it. All right, so we get in the end, Oops. and we kind of talked about this. Right. You have been given an awful lot of power. You see people at their worst. You need to treat them respectfully. You need to provide them the privacy and the respect that they need and to treat them and recognize their rights to make decisions, even if you disagree with them. Or duty to act. All right, so we talked about that. Ethical responsibility. We talked about that. Responsibility to act for Stephen. All right. Questions, comments? So we got 30 minutes to do a whole other slide. Do you want me a short little break? Yes, please.